glad to hear who Christ calls blessed. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers are the persecuted. Now the prayer of the day. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Living God in Christ, you make all things now new. You transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace, and in the renewal of our lives, make known your glory through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our name of God, our help, and may his best.
instruction of God through the recitation, recitation from the ten words. And God spoke all these words saying, the eighth commandment, you shall not steal. What does this mean? We should fear and love God, so that we do not take our hands on the Lord's judgment, or get them in the hands of God's way, but in all things of the room, protect the suggestion of the Lord. Now, in the summary of the law, found in Matthew, the 22nd chapter, 37 to the 40th verses. Our Lord Jesus said, We shall love the Lord God. greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
to the eighth verse. Deals with what does the Lord require? Justice, kindness, and humility. Stand up and state your case against me. Let the mountains and the hills be called to witness your complaints. And now, O mountains, listen to the Lord's complaint. He has a case against his people. He will bring charges against Israel. O my people, what have I done to you? What have I done to make you tired of me? Answer me, for I brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you from slavery. I sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam to help you. Don't you remember, my people, how King Balak of Moab tried to have you cursed, and how Balaam, son of Bear, blessed you instead? And remember your journey from Acacia Grove to Gilgal, when I, the Lord, did everything I could to teach you about my faithfulness. What can we bring to the Lord? Should we bring him burnt offerings? Should we bow before God most high with offerings of yearling calves? Should we offer him thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Should we sacrifice our firstborn children and pay for our sins? No, people. The Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you. To do what is right, to love mercy, and to love walk home humbly with your God. The word of the Lord. Now for the Psalter, those who do the right, do right, live in, in the presence of God. This is taken from Psalm 15. Who may worship in your sanctuary, Lord? Who may enter your presence and your holy God? Those who lead blameless lives and do what is right, seeking the truth from sincere hearts. Those who refuse to gossip. Or harm your neighbors or speak evil of their friends. Those who despise flagrant sinners and honor the faithful followers of the Lord. And keep their arms to the universe. Those who lend money without change charging interest. And who do not be bribed to lie about the innocent, such evil will stand for and forever. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, and I will be forever. Amen. Now for the second reading, this is from 1 Corinthians, first chapter, 18 to the 33 verse. Talks about the foolishness of the cross to change the wisdom of the world. The, met, the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we who have been saved know it is very, the very power of God. As the scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, and the world's brilliant debaters? God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish, since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom. He has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven, and it is foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended, and the Gentiles say, it all nonsense. But to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. The foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans, and God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you are wise in the world's eyes, or powerful, or worthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that the powerless to that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, 
and use them to bring to the nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he freed us from sin. Therefore, as the scriptures say, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One who is true and righteous man, 
this wonderful description in, in Isaiah, right? The Isaiah vision, which is the lion lies down with the lamb, the child plays over the, over the serpent. Um, uh, God's holy mountain may neither have war or learn of war anymore. Swords are beaten to plowshares and spears are between books. That kind of imagery is just this wonderful, wonderful picture of, of what is to come. And so what Jesus is saying is now in your presence, the kingdom of God has arrived. Or and as Matthew would say, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that means that God's reign is to, and this is what God's reign looks like. <clears throat> the poor in spirit are, are, are inherit heaven, right? Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those who mourn are comforted. Those who are meek, or as this translation says, those who are humble. I like meek better, but that's it. The meek shall inherit the earth. Friends, the meek do not inherit the earth in this world. The mighty and the strong inherit the world. Those who are uh, willing to be aggressive and take hold of things, they inherit the earth, not in the kingdom of God. The last shall be first, the first shall be last. Doesn't that make sense now when you hear that? Because that's the order of the kingdom. Because everybody is more willing to help, to lift up, to bring forth, and especially those who are downtrodden or marginalized or, or in some way uh, disregarded, you're going to bring those people up. That's the kingdom of God, and that's what Jesus is talking about. As I was thinking about all the things that are listed, the way, they're fun to muse on. It's just take, um, just think about them, dwell on them. Um, you know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was known for, uh, I sent out the text, uh, the daily text every day. And that's really the reason I do that. It's a Moravian church that's been doing it for 300 years. But the reason is because um, Teacher Bonhoeffer loved the daily text. And what he would do is he would take that text and think about it. He'd dwell on it and let it ruminate over it. Uh, by the way, they're, they're done indiscriminately. So they just have uh, like 2,000 texts. And every year they go by a lot and pull these out. Then they correlate the New Testament with the Old Testament text. That's how they get them. But anyway, the, it was really powerful when I thought about it. And so, um, ever since COVID, we've been doing it. And so, that's the idea. Well, you can do that with these texts from the Sermon on the Mount. Just take one and think about what does it mean to be poor in spirit? And it's really one of humility, of meekness, of, um, of, of yielding to God. Right? Blessed are those. And I, I kind of like the way it says at the end of this translation. I, I mean, I like the poor in spirit the best, but having said that, in this translation it says, God blesses those who are poor. And that's what Luke says, by the way. He, he leaves off the poor in spirit. He just says, blessed those who are poor, and realize their need for God. They're blessed. That's the, that, this openness to God, this dependence upon God, which is so powerful and profound. That's what we're getting at. But I was thinking about this in the context of Micah 6, because that's the way the lectionary works. Just so you know, what we do is we start with the gospel. Um, and in the gospel, we have um, um, you know, this passage from Matthew. And so then we say, what in the Old Testament kind of prefigures that or gives it some, and it's, and it's uh, Micah 6. Because I think Micah 6 summarizes what Jesus is trying to get to. And then the psalm is a response to the Old Testament lesson. It's not a response to the gospel. It's a response to the Old Testament lesson. And then the epistle lesson is off on its own, okay? So, so we're just looking at 1 Corinthians. Um, it, this wonderful, it's a wonderful text, of course. But uh, that doesn't necessarily correlate, doesn't really line up with these texts. But now listen to what the, what the prophet is saying here. So this has to do with what God wants, okay? So, with what shall I come before Yahweh? and bow myself before God and high. So I'm going to come before God, and what is it that God desires? What is it that God expects from me? What does God really want? Now, there are all kinds of things that are acceptable, okay? It's not like there are any of the other things that you are bad, but what it do is getting at the heart of the matter. It's getting to the point. What's really important here? Okay, I'll give you a quick illustration. You've heard me talk about my infamous Pickle sermon. I was a young pastor. I was in Montpelier, Indiana. If you don't know where Montpelier, if you know where Marion, Indiana, it's 20 miles east of there. It's a little tiny town, 2,000 people. And so it was my first full. I, I was an associate pastor in Chesterton. Now they took me to this church. Okay. 
So I'm the pastor there. And um, so when I got there, they had had this big rubbish sale of some kind. And the women's auxiliary, or whatever they called, the United Methodist Women's Auxiliary, was called, uh, they were selling pickles. And so I think I might have gone up. I can't remember the story, but I, I helped them. And then later in the year, they asked me to uh, judge a Halloween contest. The town. I was one of the judges on a Halloween contest. I tried. I told them I was all open for bribes, but they, nobody bribed me. And, and then I did something else. I can't remember what it was. And so then I was talking about my ordination vows in a sermon one time. And I was saying, like, you know, I had just been ordained as a full-time member. And um, it, the thing was, it said, um, uh, you know, it said, take thou authority. My ordination vows were, uh, you know, when I was commissioned, it said, Paul Anderson, take thou authority to preach the word of God and minister his holy sacraments. You, you notice there's nothing about pickles there, right? Or the, or the bazaar or whatever else that they had to do that was ancillary. Right? And so my point was in the sermon that that's the whole purpose. That's why I was there. Preach the word of God and minister his holy sacraments. That that's the role. That's what's most important. And it wasn't that those things were not. Because after all, I did do them. It wasn't like I had shunned them. Well, <laughs> you would have thought I committed the cardinal sin. I was, it was like some lady, this very nice, sweet old lady was that she was so bad she was going to get up and walk out. She was obviously involved in the thing. I was like, I think they missed the point. <laughs> Which is, you learn a lot, by the way, right? what you think you said and what they hear, right? I didn't even, I wasn't condemning her anyway. And the fellow who talked to me about it was, he understood it, so it was really great. And anyway, we got through it. But I thought it was so funny about the way that worked. But my point was, if it was comparative, it's not either or, it could be both and, but it's what's most important. That's what's going on here. It's not like he's going to say, well, don't ever offer a sacrifice. Don't ever do much of any of these things. That's not the point of the prophet. He's doing it a comparative thing and says, here's what's really important. This is the first priority, if you will. Okay? So when you come before God, what is it God desires? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? You know, that's a really proper sacrifice. Will Yahweh be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 um, of rivers of oil? Like if, if, if one ram's good, maybe a thousand rams would be better kind of thing. Shall I give him my first, my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? This is now it's just getting ridiculous, right? That's actually opposite. We've got actually forbids that. And so then Micah says, He has showed you, O man, O person, what is good, and what does Yahweh require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. There's the that's what, that's the beatitudes, right? So that's really getting at it. It's just a nice summary, but there you go. Blessed are the poor in spirit. To love just and to walk humbly. That's really what the poor in spirit is, to walk humbly with your God. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the pure in heart. Well then, let's jump to, to Psalm 15. Okay? Because this goes right with it. So when we got to pure in heart, it's to think of it. Okay. So we got Psalm 15. O Lord, O Yahweh, who shall sojourn in thy tent? Okay. Who shall dwell on thy holy hill? So we, you know, uh, by the way, holy hill would be another way of saying the temple. How can you get into this place, this place of God? How can you be in God's presence? How can you be in heaven with God? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth from his heart, who does not slander with his tongue, nor and does no evil uh, to his friend, he takes no reproach against his neighbor, and in whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but who honors those who fear Yahweh, who swears, in the, um, who swears at, to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money as interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. Especially that first part, he who walks blamelessly and does what is right. Blessed are those who are hungry and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are those who do right, even when it costs, they'll be in there, there's the kingdom of heaven. And guess what? When you do that, when you do what is right, and you're, 
just follow it. it. In spite of the fact you might get persecuted in this life, it doesn't matter because in that age to come, you will be rewarded just as the ancient prophets were. You're in line with them. More importantly, you're in line with Jesus. So that's what he's really getting at. So then when you hear this, it's real simple. When you hear everything else that follows, you'll, you'll understand the same thing. Oh, my, one of my favorite examples is the golden rule. Do unto others, and by the way, that's in the Sermon on the Mount, that's in Matthew. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Why? If you do that, what happens? That's what the kingdom of God is going to be like. Now, I just like to think of it like this. It's kind of a recent way of thinking about it. So the kingdom of, of, of God, right, uh, is going to be perfect. It's going to be perfect in heaven. When God comes and establishes the new heaven and new earth, and everything's going to be taken care of. Why? What happens that that makes that possible? Because what happens in this world is occasionally somebody does unto others as they would do unto themselves. Maybe even frequently, but not always. And it, not everybody, okay? So it's not always not everybody. In the kingdom of God, it is everybody and always. So if you think about that, just think about that one thing. If everybody always did unto others as they would have them do unto them, right? If they did that, wouldn't that be almost perfect? Wouldn't that? Just that thing alone, if that actually was to come to place, and that was the way, wouldn't that be? How much pain and suffering would be alleviated if that was the standard operating procedure of the world in which we live? Or a whole host of other things that you hear about in there. Um, if, you know, he who, uh, if you don't, you know, when, you, when you're, you're, you're asked to go a mile, or when somebody strikes you on the right, you turn to them the other also. And if you didn't have vengeance and revenge, but you had this ability to reach out and to love in that way, it would be unbelievable. It would be perfect. So that's what Jesus is getting at in this thing. And it goes back to Micah when Micah says, that this is what God really wants. Do you love justice? Yeah. Do, justice means righteousness, doing what is right. Okay? Do you like, be kind, be gracious, be merciful. That's what God wants. And walk humbly with your God. That takes care of everything. I, I've heard this said, and I don't remember it was the Quakers, I've said it many times, but the Quaker or Augustine, I'm not really sure which one is, love God, this is his line, love God and do what you should. I think that's really what Mike is getting at, okay? He's like saying, when you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? The greatest commandment. And which we say every week, right? That that's what we try to do. That when we do that, then everything falls into place. Paul says the whole law can be summed up in this, uh, summed up in this love your neighbor as yourself. And you do those things, you've got it. And that's what Jesus is talking about in the Sermon on the Mount. The way in which that looks as we live on our life together. And that's why it's such an important sermon. That's why it's this great announcement about the world as it is to be. Now, here's the key. So that's going to happen. So you could just say that that is a predictive thing. That's the way the world is. It's given us a picture of what the kingdom of God is going to be like. There's many other examples of that in his teaching, right? That's what the kingdom of God is going to be like. So now we've heard the message. We've heard that. So the idea is that as we come to Christ, as we live in Christ, then what is going to be is the way we live now. Right? So why don't we see vengeance? Because actually, in the world, you know, the world's motto is here's the goal world for the world. Do unto others before they do it unto you. Or he who has the gold rules, right? That's that's kind of the way it is in this world. But no, I mean it, by the way, I can't argue that that wouldn't be successful. You have to get your leg up. You have to take advantage. You have to go do all those things. Right? Be aggressive. It does work in this world at one level, right? But as followers of Jesus, we don't do that. We do the opposite. We say, we will do unto others as we have them do unto us. We will be the kind of people that Jesus is. And that might mean instead of being aggressive and having so far, we'll be meek. Knowing that we may not inherit the world now, but we will inherit the world 
in the sense that God's in God's kingdom. That that's the promise. So we live in this life as if we are already in the kingdom of God. Sometimes that doesn't make sense. And you know, there's this it's obviously more complicated than just that. Because we do have to live in this world. And there's a lot of things we have to do just because we live in this world. Right? One of my favorite examples. It's a sad example, but it's one of my favorite. A number of years ago, they had some kind of threat at an event in Cincinnati. I remember it was Cincinnati. And they had to get out of the building. And there were a number of people that were crushed to death. Because everybody in that building was said, it's more important that I get out of that building than the person in front of me. So when that person in front of me fell down or whatever, we just step on them and keep going. That's the way it is here. I'm not surprised by it. Many examples of that, by the way. Just have to remember that one. In the kingdom of God, it would be, I'm going to make sure everybody else gets out before I do. You get out. You go ahead of me. Because that's what's most important. That's what we do. We're concerned more about others than ourselves. That's the way of the kingdom. Just one example. That's the way of the kingdom. And I think that's what Jesus is getting at. So as we read this sermon, as we read these Beatitudes, we recognize that the blessing comes for following in the way of Christ, is what he calls us to be, to do. Which is actually just following in his example. Let us pray. Oh Lord God, we do give you thanks for the way in which you bless and enrich our lives. Help us to see you, to know you, to love you. In ways that are appropriate and good, the way you have desired for us that we might seek justice and love kindness and walk humbly as you are. Thank you, Lord, for your wonderful love and grace. Help us to hear the sermon that Jesus gives with those kind of ears that are receptive and willing to follow and to obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Let's continue then. Apostles Creed, we please stand. The Apostles Creed in a while. With the whole church, let us confess our faith. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe, I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. And do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Lord. Thank you, Mr. Peter. Are there any further concerns that need to be raised at this time? Any prayer? I'm sure he is. <laughs> Very good. So, Bob Schumacher's at home. Um, prayers for a friend of ours, Rich. He's been in and out of the hospital. Um, undergone a lot of testing. You still can't find out what's wrong with him. So, just prayers for healing. Prayers for healing for Rich. For Rich. Pray for Rich. Yes, John. Yeah, I, I want to pray for a group of people. Most of us, some of us know, some of us don't. One of the big problems in this country is the loneliness that is around us. The pandemic. If any of you read the newspapers, you find out there's how many people that are living in nursing homes and so forth. Nobody comes to visit them. How many people live in, in nursing homes or small apartments and so forth that have nothing? Their, their siblings are gone. Their parents are gone. Their children are gone. They're alone. This is a real crisis in this country. And I think 
I, I want to pray for that people. We may have it right here in this church. And that's a problem that we have, and we need to recognize it and pray for them. Okay, pray for acute loneliness that folks are suffering from. Anybody else? Um, Lila Payet is on the prayer list. Um, she is um, went from the hospital to the nursing home. Um, her daughter told me that she's interested, they thought about putting her into hospice, but I, they only come once a week or something. I couldn't quite figure it out. But her daughter's suffering from cancer, so it's kind of a double whammy. Um, I'm to do this. And so uh, she's able to go to the Beach Her Manor. Uh, for some of you who don't know, Fly House always sits in the right in the back row there. Uh, she comes by herself. But uh, anyway, pray for her. Any other prayer concerns? Let's try to get rid of the prayers of the people. Join our hearts and minds in prayer. Let us call on the name of the Lord, saying, O God of grace, let us peace. We pray for the church. Help us to be a true and living sign of the faith, hope, and love we have in you, reaching out for the life of the world. O God of grace, let us peace. And we do pray for the world, the world in which we live, that is full of difficulties and problems of one kind or another. We pray that you would uproot systems of oppression, sweet out violence and corruption, and plant new seeds of life and hope. O oh God of grace, I bless us we pray for this community and the communities in which we live. Rescue those who are in trouble in our streets and our homes. Protect the vulnerable from danger. O oh God of grace, I bless us And we pray for our loved ones. Comfort and heal those who are sick and give us the wisdom and grace to help them in their suffering. O oh God of grace, Bless us well, we have raised up uh, concerns today, and we're thankful, Lord, that you hear our prayers. We are thankful that Bob has returned home, and he's so glad to be home, and that um, he'll be able to negotiate the, uh, the, the situation, the things that uh, he has to deal with, as well as April. We thank you, Lord, um, for your blessing in our lives when we have those uh, difficult moments that uh, are resolved. Pray for Rich as he's suffering, he's healing, uh, especially under the frustration of not knowing what's going on. Uh, be with his doctors and give them wisdom as they deal with that situation. Um, we pray for the concern that John raised, the concern of loneliness that exists in our world, um, especially we think about older people who are uh, often stuck in a nursing home somewhere and uh, family has disappeared. For whatever reason, sometimes, sadly, sad to say, it's just because of their lack of concern. But we know it's so important to be concerned for those who are suffering. So we pray that uh, their loneliness would be alleviated. Some, some, it's just a product of life. Sometimes we know that, but nevertheless, uh, maybe there's some way in which we or others could help and make a difference. So we pray, Lord, that you would uh, put that in our hearts. Pray that good things would come from the small ways in which we can make a difference in people's lives. We're thankful for those who do uh, reach out and help. And it's really a wonderful thing. So it's a sacred thing, a holy thing. We pray that uh, you would bless our efforts. Uh, I pray personally for my daughter, who is um, in the process of moving back to our community. Looks really good and promising. We pray that it'll continue. And of course, we're very excited about that, as well as Amy's daughter and son in law and grandson, who also uh, will be coming back here. We pray that everything will be good in that regard. And we pray that you, <laughs> I pray that you be with Amy and me as we deal with all this new life. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, so much for your wonderful love and your grace and your peace and the opportunity we have to be here to love you. Thank you, Lord. And we conclude. Mighty God, strengthen your people so that we may live in the world as those you have chosen and called through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's continue now with the great thanksgiving. <coughs> the Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, O Lord our God. On you, O oh Lord, we depend.
from our birth. You are our hope and trust from the days of our youth, and you will always be our rock and refuge. Therefore, we praise you. Join the song of the Universal Church of the Heavenly Choir. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is Jesus Christ, our Savior. Jesus is the fulfillment of your promise, the hope of prophets, the balm of healing, the voice of all grace and truth. We give you thanks to the Lord Jesus on the night before he died took bread. And after giving thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take hey, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Same way after supper, he took the cup. Again, he gave thanks, gave it to his disciples, and said, This cup is a new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink it as often as you shall drink it in remembrance of me. For every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the death of our Lord Jesus until he comes. Therefore, let us proclaim the great mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Remembering your goodness and grace, we offer ourselves to you with gratitude as we share this joyful feast. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this bread and cup. Make us one in the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. Teach us to strive for the greater gifts when we wait to see you face to face. Abiding in faith, hope, and love. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, we bless you, our Father, the God of glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And as our Savior Christ has taught us to pray, so we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory of the forever and after. Amen. <coughs> Hallelujah. Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. <coughs> the body of Christ, the bread of heaven broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of Christ I for you. And be thankful. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Take and drink in remembrance of Christ I for you. And be thankful.
grace to shine upon you and grace to unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. We pray in the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.